Hello, and welcome to the next in our series of videos on IFRS and IFRS Corporates. I'm Sandra Thompson, I lead our Global Accounting Technical Group for Financial Instruments. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Kijan de Vries. Kijan is from the Netherlands, where he's part of our Financial Instruments practice and also part of our Global Accounting Technical Group. And also by Volker Trept. Volker is a German consulting partner on corporate treasury matters. Kijan and Volker are going to talk about measurement of financial assets under IFRS 9, and in particular how corporates that factor receivables need to build that into their assessment. But before I hand over to them, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the model in IFRS 9. IFRS 9 has three measurement categories for financial assets amortised cost, fair value with changes going through OCI or other comprehensive income, and finally, fair value with changes going through the income statement. In deciding which category to use, a company has to think about two tests. The first is the business model test, why are you holding the asset? And that's the one we're going to focus on today. The next is what's called the cash flow characteristics test, whether cash flows are solely payments of principal interest. We'll talk more about that next time. So the slide shows the three possible business models under IFRS 9. The first is held to collect, where an asset is held to collect contractual cash flows. And that kind of asset can qualify for amortised cost. But there are two other business models. The next is how to collect and sell, where some of the assets in a group are collected and others are sold. That kind of model results in fair value through OCI, changes in fair value going through other comprehensive income. And finally, the third business model, the other business model, is often referred to as held to sell. And that's when an asset is held primarily with the intent of selling it. For those kinds of assets, you have fair value through the income statement. Now, as you might have guessed, the number of sales an entity makes is key in deciding which of those three business models applies. And that's where factoring is relevant. A factoring transaction that results in derecognition, an accounting sale if you like, is a sale for the business model test as well. And with that, I will hand over to Kijan and Volker. Factoring with trade receivables is a common practice for industrial companies. Currently, the accounting discussions are about derecognition of trade receivables in those programs and the effects of balance sheet and income statements. So, Kijan, is there any change through IFRS 9? Well, Volker, uh, the answer is yes and no. On the one hand, the derecognition rules will not change compared to those under IS 39. So you still have the same discussion of whether a receivable can be taken out of the balance sheet once it is sold. But under IFRS 9, um, the classification and measurement of accounts receivables is driven by two factors that we don't have in the IS 39. It's the business model and it's the test of whether the characteristics of the financial asset meet those of solely payments of principal and interest which is required to measure uh, them at amortized cost. Um, I think the first one, uh, or the, the, the SPPI test is easily met because uh, accounts receivable will meet the test of uh, being solely a payment of, uh, of principal. The second um, uh, test will uh, be different than IS39 because the question is why do you have the accounts receivables? And if you constantly sell them to a factoring company, then the question is whether your business model is still held to collect, or whether it's held to collect and sell, or whether it's held for trading. In factoring, I think with the uh, result of due recognition, it's clear the intention to sell the receivables before maturity, and therefore the measurement of the trade receivables at cost may be no more a uh, chance. Um, therefore, I think trade receivables have to be recognized and measured at fair value. And the only question, as you said before, is whether it's for value through other comprehensive income or for value through p and uh, And the distinction, as you said, is, is the business model, whether the company still do both hold trade receivables to the maturity or to sell them during the life until maturity. And uh, in, in many cases where the company has a policy on regular selling trade receivables uh, before maturity, it seems to be that the category for various p and might be the right category to put them into. Yes, I agree. And I think it's also important to mention the fact that um, the assessment does not have to be done on a receivable by receivable basis, but you would generally do this on a portfolio basis as managed by the company. So it could well be that 
certain receivables portfolio are never factored and therefore still meet the SPPI test as well as the uh, help to collect test and therefore are accounted for at amortized cost and other portfolios are uh, uh, regularly sold or always sold and would therefore be at fair to OCI or fair value to p &L. Um, to summarize the key points, um, factoring programs in general will change accounts receivables from being measured at amortized cost to fair value. And whether or not they are fair value to OCI or whether they are fair value to PL depends on the business model that the company has with the receivables. It may well be that you have to do this assessment on a portfolio by portfolio basis of trade receivables. Thank you, I think that was a very useful summary. Just one practical tip to conclude with. If a company does factor some receivables and not others, it might think about whether it can separate those into two different business models. So for the receivables that are sold, it might end up in a how to collect and sell fair value OCI or indeed a how to sell model. On the other hand, if there is a discrete group of receivables that are not factored and not sold, those could be how to collect. But if you're going to make any changes to business models, they have to be done before IFRS 9 is adopted in January 2018. So that's it for this time. I hope you'll join us next time. If you'd like to subscribe for the whole series, please click on the button at the bottom of your screen. Bye-bye.